Carl Linnaeus classified organisms into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. A good mnemonic for this is King Philip came over for good soup. The binomial, or Latin name for an organism, is just the genus and its species combined. As time went on, it turned out that another level above kingdom was needed, domain. The three domains are archaea, that's primitive bacteria, true bacteria and eukaryota. That's everything else, of course, with DNA and a nucleus in the cells. Archaea, by the way, are often found in extreme environments on the Earth. They can, therefore, be called extremophiles. Organisms generally compete for food, water, space and other things like CO2 and light for plants, shelter and mates for animals. Interdependence is the term given to the fact that organisms can rely on each other for these things, and they can form a community. Abiotic factors in an ecosystem are the non-living aspects, for example light, temperature, moisture, soil pH, CO2 and O2 levels in the air. Biotic factors are due to organisms and things like food that's available, predators, prey, other organisms around, pathogens, breeding behaviour and more. We can use a quadrat to estimate the size of a population of an organism in an area by sampling, say, around 10% of the area, taking a mean and then multiplying up for the whole area. Using a quadrat with a transect allows us to observe how population distribution or density changes over a distance. A food chain shows the direction that biomass and therefore energy flows in an ecosystem from one trophic level to another. Producers are any organisms that use sunlight to produce biomass, that's usually plants or algae. Primary consumers eat the producers, that's herbivores that only eat plants, or omnivores that eat both meat and plants. Then predators, known as secondary consumers, that could be carnivores or omnivores, prey on these, and then we can have tertiary consumers as well. Apex predators, they're at the top of the food chain. They have no natural predator above them. Population numbers of all of these will fluctuate in an ecosystem over time. By the way, this food chain is possible. I looked it up. Bears have been known to eat foxes. All life is carbon-based, which means that when organisms die, the carbon is recycled, which ultimately can be then used to make more organisms. One way, of course, is when CO2 is produced, which plants then use to grow. Bacteria also release CO2 due to respiration when an organism undergoes decomposition. Temperature and other factors can affect rate of decomposition. Water also follows a cycle. Rain falls, precipitation, then runs into rivers, then into the sea, then it's evaporated, and the cycle continues. Farmers utilise decomposition to produce natural fertilisers that can then be used on crops. It can also be used to produce methane gas to be used as fuel. Biodiversity is one of those buzzwords that's very much in vogue at the minute. Basically, it just means how many different types of organisms you have in an ecosystem. High biodiversity generally makes for a stable ecosystem, as organisms don't have to depend on one species for a resource, for example. Human development usually results in lower biodiversity. Such development also poses problems when it comes to waste. We're having to find more ways of disposing of sewage, fertilisers, toxic chemicals, atmospheric pollution and more to reduce our impact on the environment. One factor is the land that we need for building, quarrying, farming and disposing of waste. An example of this is the destruction of peat bogs to make compost, which affects the habitat of many organisms and microorganisms. Burning peat also releases CO2. Deforestation bad on a big scale, flattening forests reduces biodiversity and it's often done to create farmland. A pyramid of biomass is a way of viewing a food chain which shows us how much mass enters the next trophic level, relatively. You need to be able to draw one on graph paper using numbers supplied in the question and also calculate the percentage absorbed by the next level. As per usual, any percentage is equal to the bit divided by the lot times 100. Of course, it's always a pyramid, and that shows us that biomass is lost at each level, as not all biomass is absorbed or consumed into the next organism. Some is lost due to the organisms living for some time before being eaten by a predator, for example. They have to move, they have to excrete. It's also lost as water, urea, and CO2. Food security is a big thing at the minute, especially in these uncertain days. Food is becoming scarcer due to increasing world population, changing diets, food being transported around the world, which requires huge amounts of energy, changing growing environments, the cost of farming, that's a big one in the minute, and conflicts. For example, around 40% of the world's wheat comes from Ukraine, or at least it used to. Farmers are constantly trying to find more efficient ways of farming, largely by maximising biomass inputs to crops and animals, while also reducing biomass lost by them. Fishing sustainably is also a big thing. 
if a species is fished at a greater rate than its breeding, then its population can disappear in those areas. One way of sustainably fishing is by having nets with holes that catch adult fish but are big enough to let the little ones out. These escape to then go on and breed. Nitrogen also follows a cycle. Nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, N2, is converted into nitrates by nitrogen-fixing bacteria found in soil or root nodules of some plants. Other bacteria and some fungi convert proteins into ammonia during decomposition of urine, faeces or dead organisms. This ammonia is converted into nitrates by nitrifying bacteria. Now that we have nitrates, they can enter plants through the roots and can be used by them for growth. Nitrates are turned back into nitrogen gas by denitrifying bacteria. Gosh, there's a bacterium for everything. Man-made fertilizers contain nitrates to help crops grow. Of course, if too much is used, water, say from rain, can cause it to run off into ponds and lakes where the water is still. This causes algae on the surface to bloom, making a barrier that stops light from reaching underwater plants. These then die, and respiring bacteria feeding on this dead plant material use up more oxygen in the water, starving fish and other creatures of it, and they die. This is eutrophication. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.